Hello everyone and a really warm welcome to Ask the Experts Towards New Therapies for Low-Grade Serous Ovarian Cancer. We are so pleased to, to see so many of you here today. I'm Lizzie Hussain, I'm Deputy Director of Services at Target Ovarian Cancer and I'm thrilled today to welcome Charlie Gawley, Clinical Director of the Cancer Research UK Scotland Centre and Dr Emma Dennett, Target Ovarian Cancer's Research Manager who will be delivering the session and answering your questions. So this is uh, looking to be a really great session. Um, first, we'll hear from Dr. Emma Dennett about how our research program works, research projects that we have funded, and more about our research champions program. We will then hear from Charlie, who will be sharing the valuable information that his recent research project has contributed and how the findings can hopefully be built on to develop new treatments. Next up will be your chance to have your questions answered by Charlie and Emma in our live question and answer session. And now I've just got a little section on disclaimers. So nothing that comes out of this session is not medical advice and it isn't a substitute for the information and advice you've been given by your own clinical team. We're not able to ask for answers to very specific individual situations today, but the idea of this session is that we can give you an overview um, and then you can take that back for any conversations that you'd like to have with the team who are treating you. If anything comes up today that you aren't sure about, if you don't know what it means for you or your loved one, or if you have any more questions or concerns, then you can call our support line to get more information. So we'll move into Emma's presentation. Hi there, my name's Emma Dennett and I'm the research manager here at Target Ovarian Cancer. I'm delighted to be speaking to you today to tell you a little about our research programme. Research is one way that the charity gives hope to those affected by ovarian cancer now and in the future. We fund pioneering research to stop ovarian cancer devastating lives. This is mainly laboratory based work performed by researchers working at universities in the UK. Those researchers are often working in the NHS as doctors or surgeons alongside their research. We have offered funding most years since 2012 and we involve research champions as well as researchers and clinicians in making sure that we fund the highest quality research. So what research do we actually do here at Target Ovarian Cancer? Well, we have funded 11 research projects so far, awarding over £1.6 million to research. Over the past few years, we have funded projects that involve translational research. This is research aimed at translating research from the laboratory into results that directly affect benefit people. You may also have heard this being called Bench to Bedside. Our research grants help get our researchers' ideas from the laboratory into the hospital, from trials into treatments, like the work completed by Professor Charlie Gawley, who you're going to hear from shortly. So why is this important? Why is the research important? Well, the translation research projects that we fund aim to do one of a number of things, including developing new target, targeted treatments, understanding um, resistance that develops towards treatments, understanding immunotherapy, understanding existing treatments and how they work, and personalising treatment. From genetics to immunotherapy, the research teams we fund are also developing critical new skills, understanding and experience, so not only are our researchers working to improve outcomes and find better, more personalised treatments, but our grants are also making sure that the next generation of researchers are being trained up to continue research into ovarian cancer. So how do we choose our research projects? Well, we want our research funding to go to the best people running the best projects. That's why we ask leading ovarian cancer researchers and clinicians to advise us on the research topics and areas that need investment. Our expert scientific advisory board a group of highly experienced scientists, researchers and clinicians, and our panel of research champions, made up of women and families affected by ovarian cancer, review all the grant applications that we receive, and they make recommendations on the project that will have real scientific impact. We want people affected by ovarian cancer at the heart of our research. Our research champions make sure the real life experiences of those affected by ovarian cancer lead discussions around the research we fund. Anyone affected by ovarian cancer can join our network, including those with a diagnosis and their family and friends. So moving on to our projects, I want to give you a brief overview of two of our recently completed projects and then tell you about our new project. The first is a project that explored the immune system. This project was led by Professor James Brenton from the CIUK Cambridge Institute. The team developed a new computational tool to analyse the tumour microenvironment. This is the space in and around the tumour that has many types of cells and molecules. Using the tool, they show that chemotherapy increases the level of helpful immune, system, immune cells in the tumour microenvironment. They are currently taking forward the research into natural killer cells and how they work to kill tumours. 
The second recently completed project that I want to talk about today was led by Pr Professor Richard Edmondson at the University of Manchester. As we're sitting here together listening to this presentation, our DNA is breaking in places and our cells are naturally repairing those DNA breaks using a DNA repair response process. If DNA isn't repaired, then the cells may start to divide and this may be the beginning of cancer. This project uses information about what problems tumour cells have with repairing their own DNA to predict who is likely to benefit from chemotherapy treatment for their own cancer and who is likely to experience a recurrence. This means that in the future people who are likely to benefit can start chemotherapy and those who are unlikely to benefit could be spared the treatment and the harmful side effects that come with it. These important results are already being taken forward into the next stage of research. Richard recently gave a talk on this project we have a brief five minute video and a full recording of the talk available on our YouTube channel. So moving on, we're really excited to have announced our newly funded researcher project a couple of weeks ago. Led by Sadaf Gay Magami at Imperial College London, she is looking to understand more about the immune system response in those with high grade serous ovarian cancer. The immunotherapy has been successful for some cancers, but so far not ovarian cancer. So this project could provide crucial evidence for the future. The photos on the slide of our recent visit to the laboratory. Sadaf is over here on the left and her postdoctoral researcher Hainan Lu is here on the right. So what about the impact of our research? The ultimate goal of all research is to improve the lives of the patients with ovarian cancer. The journey from research to the clinic can be a long one and there can be several stages that require additional funding. So one way that we can show the impact of our funding is to look at whether the projects that we fund go on to their next natural stage of research. So we collect data on whether researchers have gone on to secure additional funding from other funders. We have found that for every £1 we spent, our researchers have leveraged a further £1 and two pence in additional funding. And this is a fantastic endorsement of the importance of the research that our researchers do. Another way of looking at the early successes of our research is to think about how many publications have been produced across the projects. Our researchers have published 12 research papers describing their results. As I said a few slides ago, a lot of the research is important because it increases understanding of the biology of ovarian cancer and publications are one of the main ways that information about research is shared within the scientific community and so other scientists can build on the research that our researchers have done. As I draw to a close, I want to share a bit about what's next for our research programme. We are in the final stages of developing our new research strategy and we are looking forward to sharing that with you in the coming months. Back in November last year, we held two workshops with some of our research champions and they gave us a good sense of what is important to them. We also talked with lots of experts in research and doctors and surgeons practising across the UK. As a charity, we want to continue to grow our research programme and to call for an increase in funding for ovarian cancer research more broadly, as we know that this is underfunded compared to the past and also compared to funding for other cancers. We are looking at forming partnerships with other funders in the UK so that we can continue to support research now and to continue to develop the skills of the research leaders in the future. We also want to continue to hold a space for our research champions to understand more about our research and our goal for the coming years is to, for research chapters to directly contribute to the design of the projects that we fund. So that concludes my overview. Many thanks for coming today and for your interest in our research programme. I'm sure that Charlie is going to give us a fascinating talk in a few moments. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Emma, for that really fantastic overview of our research programme. So I'm now going to hand over to Charlie Gawley for his presentation on his recent research project and findings. So thanks very much for asking me to give this talk. And thanks also to Target Ovarian Cancer for funding a project in low-grade serous ovarian cancer. And, you know, as we're going to talk about, it's a rare form of ovarian cancer. And uh, there's been a bit less research done in this form of ovarian cancer. And it was very good of them to, you know, invest in it essentially these are my disclosures so i'm going to talk about first of all what low-grade serious vein cancer is how our research team at the nicola murray vein cancer research center in edinburgh operates we're going to talk about the key findings from our target vein cancer project i'm going to talk about where the findings from the project are taking us as a team and i'm also going to talk about um, some of the new hopes for low-grade serous ovarian cancer, uh, of which there, there are plenty. So this is the problem with ovarian cancer. It's more than one disease, or it's one of the problems. 
And the most common type is high-grade serous ovarian cancer, representing about 70% of all what we call epithelial ovarian cancer. Low-grade serous only represents about 5%. So a lot of the money, quite understandably, has gone into high-grade serous ovarian cancer. But the other issue is, until about the last 10 years, all ovarian cancer was treated the same, even though the cancers are very different. Low-grade serous ovarian cancer was only identified about 19 years ago as a separate entity. <coughs> and the thing is that these, what we know as ovarian cancers, come from different tissues, essentially, in the body. For example, the feeling is that low-grade serous and high-grade serous probably actually, for the most part, come from the fallopian tube. Um, although there is still a little bit of a question mark uh, in the case of low-grade serous. Clear cell and endometrioid ovarian cancer often come from endometriosis. So, you know, these cancers, they've got different tissues of origin. They've actually got different genes that are abnormal and they've got different responses to chemotherapy. So high-grade serous is the most chemosensitive, whereas clear cell is the most radiosensitive. That means sensitive to radiotherapy. So the problem that this creates is that, <coughs> excuse me for copying, many of the big trials that we did 20 years ago that define how we treat ovarian cancer didn't look at these subtypes separately, we looked at them all together. And therefore, some of the rules by which we determine whether patients should get chemotherapy or not mainly apply to high-grade serous because those were the most common cancers in those studies. And so it's important for us to now think about that and look back and think whether everything that we do is correct or not. So in terms of how things work in Edinburgh and how we operate, so I'm a medical oncologist. I treat ovarian cancer patients in this Edinburgh Cancer Centre, and I also do a lot of clinical trials. But about 50 yards away is this building, which um, is called the Institute of Genetics and Cancer, and this is the building where all the cancer research goes on. And it's right next door. It's where our labs are. And, and we do um, a lot of research into a number of cancers. We're also very lucky because here in Edinburgh, in, in 1982, um, this chap here, the old professor of medical oncology called John Smythe, decided to set up an ovarian cancer database, which they used for clinical research. But since it's been possible to go to the hospital and pull out the pathology blocks, which are these things, and these are the bits of people's tumor that gets removed, but we can now go and get them and we can analyze them. So we can, you know, we can look at the biology of these tumors and compare it to what happened to the patients. Now you might say, well, you can go and get the tumor from any hospital in the country. And that's true, but it's only because we've got this database that this old professor set up all these years ago that we know what happened to the to the patient and that's absolutely crucial and i've got a wee picture of this gentleman here because he's a, a, he's a, a professor of gynecological pathology and he's able to go through all the cases that we analyzed and make sure that what we thought was mucinous is mucinous and what we thought was clear cell is clear cell and then it's analyzed by my lab group some of whom are here and the main individual that did most of the research we're going to talk about here today, the low-grade serious research, is Rob Hollis. He's um, Dr. Rob Hollis. He's, um, he's now an independent fellow, but when he started this project, he was, uh, I think he, he just got his PhD, and, and this has really helped him, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the idea from our team is that we, we, we sequence these tumours, we understand what the biology means, and then we maybe do some analyses in, in the laboratory where we grow some of the cancer cells and we might put various drugs on them, sometimes a lot of drugs in these things called drug screens, in order to, to identify new therapies to put into patients. Okay. So let's, uh, let's skip on to low-grade serous ovarian cancer. So it's only about 5 or 10% of all serous ovarian cancer cancers. And it affects younger women than high-grade serous ovarian cancer. The sort of average age is 43, but there are many patients in their 20s and 30s. 
unlike high-grade serious ovarian cancer, it's fairly resistant to chemotherapy. So our standard treatment regimens don't work so well. Most patients are diagnosed when the cancer spread beyond the ovary. And because this subtype is relatively chemoresistant, we're really interested in finding new drugs that work better. There are a couple of drugs called letrozole, which is a drug used in breast cancer, and bevacizumab, which is a drug that blocks the blood supply to the tumour. These drugs seem to have some activity, which is great. Um, but doing clinical trials to show the benefits of these new therapies compared to standard of care is a big challenge because those trials need a lot of patients. And in order to achieve this, we need to have international collaboration, which is something that we've now achieved. So this is a bit about the biology and I'm going to, please don't get too caught up in this, but in order to understand what's driving a cancer, you need to know what genes are changed. And when we started this project, there had only been a few studies looking at the genes that had been changed and they only had a small number of samples in them. But most of the genes that had been changed affected this pathway here. So this is, this is the surface of the cell. And the cell gets signals from outside. On the basis of these signals, then signaling goes from this to this to this to this. These are all proteins in the cell. And then it tells the cell how to behave. And so it turns out that this is an important pathway, but we didn't really know what percentage of patients this was this pathway was abnormal in, and it causes the cell cells to divide and to survive when usually they would die. So here's this shown in another sort of way, and the, the, the main genes are RAS and RAF. So what happens is you usually get a signal going into the cell telling the cell how to behave. But if you get an abnormal copy of the gene, then rather than responding to what's going on outside, it continually sends a signal saying divide, divide, grow, grow. And so if we block that signal, for example, down here with a drug called trametinib, the idea is that could maybe um, prevent this abnormal signaling and help treat the cancer. So I'm going to turn now <coughs> to the project. And so one aspect of the project was to sequence um, a cohort of unselected low-grade serous patients. Um, and we had the, this cohort uh, from Edinburgh and also from Amsterdam. So our, our collaborators in Amsterdam sent us um, some of their tumours. We combined those with what we've got from Edinburgh in order to work out what genes were driving this uh, cancer. And it turned out that there were three genes, KRAS, BRAF, and NRAS, that we kind of knew about already. And they made up about 50% of the population. And we knew about that. But what used to be believed was that the other half of the patients didn't have an abnormality in this pathway called MAP kinase. But when we did our whole exome sequencing, which it means that you look at all the genes in the body that code for proteins, we found that there were a number of other genes in the same pathway that were also um, activated and potentially switching on that pathway. And so actually the true frequency of MAP kinase wild type was only about 20%. And when we looked at the survival, the canonical MAP kinase, so that's KRAS, BRAS, or NRAS, had a better survival. The true MAP kinase wild type had a worse survival. And these new group that we had identified had a survival in the middle. So this is important because this gives us an idea of tests we might have to do in the future in order to identify which patients are best for which drugs. And it also tells us that in newly diagnosed patients, the actual frequency of patients who don't have an aberration in this pathway is quite low. As well as doing that in newly diagnosed patients, the other plan was to look in patients who we'd included in a study. And this was a study that was done in the USA and in the UK. And it took patients whose low-grade serious ovarian cancer had come back 
And it gave, and in this study, they either got this drug trametinib, which blocked this MAP kinase pathway that I've been going on about, or they got a number of different standard of care therapies. And then we looked to see what happened to the patients. And what we found was that when the patients got the trametinib compared to the standard of care, the rate at which the cancer came back was half. And also the percentage of patients who responded to the trametinib was four times higher than the number of patients who responded to the standard of care therapy. So this came out of the clinical trial. The trial was published last year. Um, it led to this drug being accepted as a new standard treatment for low-grade serious ovarian cancer in the USA and in the UK. And I guess the other thing to say about it, it was the first ever positive randomized trial in low-grade serious ovarian cancer. As we said before, it's quite difficult to do big trials in rare cancers, but because we were able to work together with the USA, we were able to do it. But <coughs> the other important thing is that because we had the samples and because we had the individuals here, namely Rob and the funding from Target Ovarian Cancer, we, will, we were able to look at the genes that were switched on and were not switched on in these patients. And when we looked at the genes that were switched on, we, sh we showed that the patients who had the KRAS, the BRAP or the NRAS mutations, instead of having a response rate to the trametinib of 26%, they had a response rate of 50%. So this gave us a hint that these patients were going to be the ones who would respond better. Now, this bit gets a little bit complicated. I'm going to try and keep it simple. So you'll remember that in this study here, we, did, we looked at all the genes in the patient's genome to see how many had the canonical MAP kinase, how many had these new group, and how many were MAP kinase wild type. When we did this in the clinical trial, instead of finding 20% having no mutations in that pathway, we found it was 50%. And the importance of that is that it tells us that the patients whose low-grade series of vein cancer is coming back are a different group from those that initially present. And it suggests to us that the MAP kinase, the patients who do not have a mutation in any of these genes, are the patients whose cancer is more likely to come back. And we also know they, they actually have a worse outcome. So it tells us where we need to focus our research. So it makes us think, well, what is going on here? And we got a little bit of a clue from some of the other work Rob did, where he looked at something called the copy number, which is essentially the number of copies of the gene in the cell. So, so this... Along here, we've got, you know how in, the, in, in every cell in your body, you've got 22 chromosomes and in the case of a, a woman, two X chromosomes. So in patients who've got a normal two copies of each, you'd expect to see this black line centered around zero. But in cases where a bit of the chromosome is lost, it goes lower below the line, and cases where a bit of the chromosome is gained, it goes above the line. And we found a few consistent changes. And one of them was in chromosome one, where it seemed that one half of chromosome one was lost and one half was gained. At this point in time, we don't have a good explanation for that, but we believe that it's probably very important. And because of that, we're now, with our collaborators in America, planning to do something called whole genome sequencing in order to investigate that further and see if it gives us a clue about how to treat this cancer better. And then the last bit of our research project was where Rob did something called a high throughput drug screen. So he grew low-grade serious ovarian cancer cells in the lab, and then he exposed them to 1,800 different drugs these drugs had all been developed to treat cancer and some of them had already been licensed to treat other cancers. And the idea was, well, can we identify those that hit low-grade serious civilian cancer cells the best and then consider them for use in clinical trials? 
So actually, sorry, he started with 1,600 compounds and then he wanted to see hits in at least four out of six different cell lines in the lab. And that took him down to 71. And then we did a bit more filtering. We took out duplicates. We took, took out drugs that we knew already worked in low-grade serous. We removed some of the chemo drugs because we wanted biological agents, which we think are more likely to work. And we ended up with 16 compounds, which he then looked at in more detail. And when he looked at those, he found a group of them here that he was particularly interested in. And, and this was in what we call two-dimensional culture, which is when you grow cells on plastic. But he then looked at cells that weren't growing in plastic, sort of more three-dimensional um, culture, which is more representative of what happens in a patient. And he subsequently validated those. And we believe four of these are very interesting and that we're going to take further. And the last thing to mention is that in, with, in collaboration with um, you know, uh, individuals in Glasgow who have got real expertise in growing mouse models, we are, um, we've created a model of low-grade serous ovarian cancer. So I know it's, this is not everybody's cup of tea, but it really will help us work out what drugs work best together uh, to treat this disease. So what we've achieved with the target ovarian cancer and funding, we've identified the frequency of um, tumors that have got mutations in this important MAP kinase pathway. And perhaps more importantly, we've identified the percentage of patients who don't have mutations in them and, and that we need to focus on. Um, we've identified the, the impact of these defects on outcome. And we've also, in the clinical trial, of course, shown the benefit of trametinib, which is now a new recommended therapy in the USA and the UK. And we've also identified four new drugs that would be suitable for use in clinical trials. And so as a team, where has this taken us? Well, I'm part of this international consortium for low-grade serous ovarian cancer. And this is a global consortium now. And it's, it's really gaining a lot of momentum. And one of the things that we're doing as part of that consortium is we're setting up a big, what's called, um, well, this is a platform study where, so that you don't have to keep setting up lots of little studies to work out whether new drugs that you're bringing through work or not. You have one big study and you've got lots of different treatments that you can put through. And I'm currently setting this up with collaborators in the USA. And we hope, as well as testing some drugs that, you know, just from their activity and other diseases we think might be important, we hope to test some of the hits that Rob has brought through in our lab in this sort of study in patients to give us direct, um, you know, validation of our lab findings in patients. And then the last thing to say about where it's taken us as a team, when Rob started this, he just finished his PhD. And this has given him the extra momentum at a very important time in his career. It's very difficult for scientists at this stage because they've got to become independent and they've got to get independent funding and they've got to show really their value. So you know, we published um, two papers from this work a, a month ago. They both came out about a month ago. Obviously, there was the big paper in The Lancet, and Rob is currently writing another couple of papers to do with the work that he's done. So it's been immensely helpful to him at a really important time in uh, the journey for young scientists. And then <coughs> just the last slide for from your, the last slide before the summary. I'm sure a lot of you want to know about new developments. There isn't really enough time to talk about the global new developments, but there are a number. But I thought I would pick out this one. It was presented uh, in Chicago last year, but um, at, following discussion with some of the key investigators doing this study in the US, it seems that it's even gaining more traction. And that is this study where Patients 
initially present with inoperable disease. And in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, we would give them chemo to shrink down the cancer and then do an operation. But in low-grade serous ovarian cancer, chemo doesn't work very well. So it'd been noticed that there's similarity biologically between low-grade serous ovarian cancer and some breast cancers. So it was thought, why not use this regime of drugs? These are drugs that are used, govestrin and abemocycline are classes of drugs that are used in breast cancer. So why not use those in inoperable patients? And when they did that, 60% of the patients, their cancer shrunk. And this is much more than you'd hope to achieve with chemotherapy. So I'm very excited about that as a new development. So in summary, target ovarian cancer funding has really helped us unpick the biology underlying low-grade serous ovarian cancer. It's allowed us to suggest new biomarkers and new areas that we need to explore further. We've also identified four new drugs that we plan to test in the clinic. And it's also really helped the development of a talented young researcher who's devoted his career to ovarian cancer investigation. So um, I'm very grateful to uh, Target Ovarian Cancer for that. I would like to acknowledge everybody who participated in the, the big clinical trial that I spoke about, and also to our collaborators at the University of Edinburgh, University of Glasgow in the Netherlands, the University of British Columbia, and the MD Anderson in Texas, and obviously to our funders, of course, highlighting target of alien cancer. Um, and very importantly, the patients who entered the study and who also kindly donated samples to our research. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for taking us through that, that roundup of the research that yourself and Rob and others have been doing. I, I think fantastic to, to hear the progress that's been made. And um, we do have some questions from um, that have been pre-submitted for our session today. Um, and also I've seen some questions coming in uh, through the chat as well. So we've got about 15 minutes to go through these questions with you today. Um, so please do keep on adding those questions. And Charlie, if it's okay with you um, and with Emma, um, I'm just gonna shoot off with some of our first questions and we'll hopefully get through as many as we can for everyone today. So um, Charlie, first kind of question for you. Um, and I think we've got some questions that have come through on the chat as well. Um, just thinking about low-grade serous ovarian cancer and the current kind of available treatment options, could you maybe just talk us through kind of have, after having surgery, what are those available treatment options for people who have low-grade serous ovarian cancer? Yeah, so if you've had, if the tumour has been removed, then the main options are either chemotherapy or chemotherapy followed by a hormone drug such as letrozole, or I would say the letrozole on its own. Now that's, that some investigators around the world would think that's slightly controversial to say you could use letrozole on its own, but I think that's a reasonable approach. And um, you know, in some of the consensus documents that we've been writing recently, I know that some of my colleagues around the world do, do agree with that. And in fact, there's a big study being done in the US just now trying to work out whether chemotherapy is necessary at all or not. Obviously, it'll be great to have the result of that um, because that'll tell us definitively. But until we get that result, I think the jury's out. And um, some I have a discussion with my patients about the uncertainties. And with some of them, we decide to go for chemo. And some of them, we decide just to go for a drug called letrozole. So patients who have um, just been diagnosed, have had an operation, then they can get um, they can get chemotherapy or they can get chemotherapy followed by a hormone drug called letrozole or they can get just the letrozole on its own. Now, there's a study being done in the USA trying to work out whether the chemotherapy is necessary or not. I give chemotherapy to some of my patients. I explain the uncertainties. And some of them I just give letrozole to. And then the last uh, drug that I wanted to mention in this setting is bevacizumab, which is a drug that blocks the blood supply to the tumor. And it is actually a, an effective drug in low-grade serous ovarian cancer. So if your oncologist can access that for you, often in combination with chemo, then that is, that is a good strategy. 
Thank you so much, Charlie. And I think, um, you know, as always, with answers to these kinds of questions, we'd recommend if you have any queries, obviously discuss that with your clinical team about what is going to be most appropriate. And um, we've also had a question around uh, genetic testing. Um, and I think this was prompted, Charlie, by your, present, by your presentation and, and some of the work that you've been conducting in the research. Um, would you recommend that for patients with low-grade serous ovarian cancer um, that they request genetic testing and, and what testing is available on the NHS? So it's important to differentiate um, defects that happen, you know, that you inherit from your mother and father. So these gene abnormalities that I talked about in my presentation are not abnormalities that you inherit from your mother and father for the most part. These are abnormalities that occur in the tumor cells. So they're not things that would be inherited. So there isn't really, there's not a good association in low-grade serous with particular genetic mutations uh, that you would inherit. Now, if we turn to the tumor, then I do think it is helpful to know what molecular abnormalities are happening. Unfortunately, the access to tumor sequencing very much varies around the UK. Hopefully, in not too long, it will be possible for all patients with low-grade serious ovarian cancer to get some sequencing done. What I do is I ask our pathologists to look for the main genes. So I ask them to look for KRAS and BRAF. And because this are kind of pretty much well embedded in the NHS, I'm able to get that. I can't guarantee that your oncologist could. But ideally, I would want more than that. And our research is suggesting that it would be beneficial to have more than that. But we need to make the case so that that can kind of be mainstreamed for everybody. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, I'm going to hand back to Lizzie now for the next set of questions. I think Lizzie is back with us. So um, thank you again and over to you, Lizzie. We've had some questions about chemotherapy, Charlie. Um, could you tell us how effective chemotherapy is for people with low-grade ovarian cancer? Um, someone's given an example and said they um, saw advice from three different oncologists after their diagnosis and had three different opinions. So they'd be interested to know why there's such variation in practice and opinion. No, I mean, it's a, a source of controversy. That's why I smile because, I mean, it, um, it, you know, if you ask different oncologists, you will get different answers, particularly with regards to whether you should do it or not. So the clinical studies suggest a range of responsiveness from 5% to sort of 25%. The chemotherapy that we use predominantly as the first treatment for ovarian cancer is a drug called carboplatin. And it seems that the response rate to that drug is low, less than 10%. Whereas in high grade serious ovarian cancer, it's about 70%. Some of the other drugs that we generally use when other ovarian cancers come back may be slightly more effective. So the likes of paclitaxel, it may have a response rate of slightly above 10%. But again, the studies are small. They're all looking back at data that's already been collected. We did a paclitaxel in our trial, actually, as one of the options. Um, so it seems to be the best of the chemotherapies, as far as I can see. The, the chemotherapy known as Calix also has a reasonable-ish response. But none of these responses are, you know, are satisfactory. That's why we need something better. That's why we need to find these new biological therapies. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so we've asked a couple of questions about new and different forms of chemotherapy. So the first was HIPEC, which is heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And the second is PIPAC, which is pressurized intraperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy. Um, someone's asked, um, are these offered and available in the UK? So maybe you'd like to run us through that. So, I mean, Generally speaking, they're not available. So HIPEC certainly, generally speaking, is not available in the UK. This is um, something that's more applicable to high-grade serious ovarian cancer. It's not really applicable to low-grade serious ovarian cancer because 
the principle is that it improves the chemosensitivity. Now, in fact, I don't believe it's been looked at in much detail at all in low-grade serious ovarian cancer, but that's because people are still struggling with the concept of whether chemotherapy is any use at all, whether you should, you know, the whole idea of high pec is you give chemotherapy into the peritoneum at the time of the operation, but you also kind of keep the patient up. Um, I would not, so there's no evidence for its value, and I would find it hard to believe that we will ever see the evidence for its value. So PIPEC, um, this pressurized intraperitoneal chemotherapy, this is something that people are looking at in relapsed ovarian cancer, um, in, in situations where, you know, people would be in a difficult situation. Again, I would have an issue with that grade series because it's not a chemosensitive tumor. I can see why people are investigating it in high grade series of cancer, which is a chemosensitive tumor. Um, you know, obviously you never say never when you're doing research, but I don't think it would be, my focus would be to chase that. I think the chances of its success would be low. Great, thank you very much for that update. Um, and then we've had a question about length of treatment with chemotherapy. So this person said um, they had a uh, complete hysterectomy, so surgery for ovarian cancer. Um, and then they had three rounds of chemotherapy as a precaution. Um, but they've asked, what are the implications of having three rounds, so a shorter treatment term, um, rather than six? So I think in low-grade serious, that's a very reasonable strategy, to be honest with you, particularly if the disease was caught at an early stage, then, and, you know, then I think that's a very reasonable strategy because, as I've said, we don't really know the value of giving six. And, and when we do give six, we know the biggest impact is in the first three. So I would be, well, in fact, there is some evidence that in non-high-grade serious vein cancer, there is little evidence, there is little difference between three and six. There was one big study that was done that looked back at whether it was high-grade serous or it was non-high-grade serous. And obviously the non-high-grade serous contains more than just low-grade serous. But in that situation, you know, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't a big, well, there wasn't any benefit for getting six. I mean, I think it is worth doing in high-grade serous. Um, but the, the jury's out in, in terms of the number of cycles that are optimal in some of the other subtypes of ovarian cancer. Great, thank you. So moving on from chemo, we've had some questions about a uh, drug called letrozole. Yes. Um, and somebody's asked, um, is it correct? Well, no, let me rephrase that. Um, how can letrozole be used to um, stop recurrence and how effective is it in terms of treatment for low-grade serous ovarian cancer? Well, actually, letrozole seems to be one of the most effective agents um, when given, well, there was a, a study done from the MD Anderson who looked back at all the patients they treated over a number of years. And they looked to see whether they'd received the drug letrozole or a drug like it, or if they'd received none of those drugs. And when they looked back, they found that the patients who'd received the letrozole drug did much better. So, you know, they, their cancer came back um, more slowly. And in those patients um, who actually had some residual disease at the end of their surgery, if they got letrozole, the amount of time that they survived was actually longer. So, so you know, I, I believe that's a pretty decent evidence base for the role of letrozole. What letrozole does is it blocks the production of estrogen in the fat tissues in the body. Because even after the ovaries have been removed, the body still produces estrogen in the fat tissues and letrozole blocks that. And that seems to be a pretty effective strategy. So I think the evidence is fairly decent um, for letrozole having a role. Great, thank you. So now we're going to move into immunotherapy. Um, so somebody's asked, uh, why doesn't ovarian cancer respond well to immunotherapy? And then they said, what lines of research do you think could improve the treatment for ovarian cancer? 
So as a whole, that question is right because ovarian cancer as a whole doesn't respond very well to immunotherapy. One of the subtypes, clear cell ovarian cancer, does have some sensitivity to immunotherapy. One of the issues is the only immunotherapy that's been tried so far are these drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And what they do is, <coughs> well, what a cancer does is there are cells trying to eat the cancer, your immune cells, all the time these cells are trying to eat the cancer. But the, the cancer has got this way of switching on a protein that says, don't eat me. And what the immunotherapy does or the immune checkpoint inhibitors block this don't eat me signal so that the immune cells can eat the cancer. The problem is, in most ovarian cancers, the immune cells, or in many of them, the immune cells can't get near the cancer. So even if you flick this switch by using the drugs, the immunotherapy drugs, the immune cells still aren't getting in. That's in most subtypes, but there is one subtype um, called clear cell, as I say, where it seems that immunotherapy is effective. At this point in time, we have no evidence um, in low-grade serous that immunotherapy is effective. And then just to the second bit of the question about you know, other strategies. Well, I think other immune strategies may work. That is only one immune strategy. So um, there was a publication about a month ago in pancreatic cancer using RNA vaccines, similar to the COVID vaccine. And that looked very exciting. Now that's a long way off. But the thing about pancreatic cancer is it was another difficult to treat cancer. And they seemed to be able to achieve something. So I'm hoping that that might help. And then the other things that we're looking at in ovarian cancer generally are these things called antibody drug conjugates, where you've got an antibody with a chemotherapy, what they call a chemotherapy payload, and they're joined together, and the antibody targets the ovarian cancer cell, and then the whole thing gets taken into the cancer cell, and then the chemotherapy gets right to the cancer cell. And this is something that everybody's excited about now in um, ovarian cancer. Thank you. We've had a very interesting question, um, kind of blue sky thinking for you, Charlie. But um, the question is, how many more immunotherapy options do you think there could be if funding was totally unrestricted? Well, yeah, I think there, uh, there's a huge number. So we've mentioned vaccines. There are these things called CAR T cells, which work very well in some leukemias. And that's where you take the patients' immune cells, and then you genetically engineer them, and then you put them back in to specifically target the cancer. Um, you know, well, we've talked about the antibody drug conjugates, um, you know, the vaccines. There's things called, there's something called dendritic cell therapies, which are other immune cells that you could take out the patients, do engineering, put them back in. I mean, there are a number, a number of different immune options um, if funding was unrestricted. The thing is, although immunotherapy has been great in some other cancers, we shouldn't feel restricted to immunotherapy because there are strategies that have been successful in ovarian cancer, such as PARP inhibitors. I mean, they've been amazingly successful. And those are, are, are successful in patients who wouldn't respond to immunotherapy. And in fact, ovarian cancer is the disease in which PARP inhibitors have been the most successful. So rather than maybe thinking, well, ovarian cancer doesn't respond so well to the immunotherapies we've tried so far, we should think it has responded really well to PARP inhibitors. So we should look at other strategies around about that. And that targets something called DNA damage response. And I think we need to be looking harder at that side of things. Thank you. Really interesting answer to a very difficult question. Um, so we are slightly running out of time. If it's OK, well, everyone will ask a few more questions um, and then wrap up maybe five or 10 minutes after we were supposed to. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions um, about clinical trials. So one for you, Emma. Um, so, yeah, we've had some questions about clinical trials for high grade um, 
and low grade serous ovarian cancer. So people are just interested to find out um, how they find and apply to clinical trials that are already running. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, so really, the first thing to do is if you're interested in joining a trial is you could talk to your treatment team. I mean, it's going to be really important because that's how you access clinical trials. But that said, we do have a database of clinical trials available on our website. Someone's going to pop a link in the, the chat for this one. So you can go and have a look at our website. And on there, there's some more information about clinical trials and sort of what they are and what um, they go. It's popped up now. Um, you know what they are and then you can also link through to the database to see what's available i mean um what you find doesn't necessarily we try and give an invite in like an indication on that website about who might be eligible but it's important to be aware that just because you think you might be doesn't necessarily mean that you would be because we try and keep it um you know the information um understandable and accessible because it can be quite complex so if there is a trial that you think would be good do talk to your treatment team or your doctor about that um i think that's that's where to start really um and there's yeah so your treatment team should be able to discuss any trials um so if this does bring up any you know if you're looking at that that trial database and it brings up anything do feel free to contact our nurse support line and they also know about they do know about the trials on the database so they can talk to you about that as well um yeah and I just thought it might be quite nice to just briefly talk about our new projects with this question um so although Charlie just said it's uh there might be other things to look at than immunotherapy our new project is in immunotherapy and that's been run by Professor Sadaf Gay Magami and she's at um Hammersmith Hospital and that's part of Imperial College London so um yeah do watch that watch this space and hopefully there'll be some trials that platform trial that Charlie was talking about um launching at some point so yeah that's it lovely thank you very much Emma so I think we're just going to start to wrap up now um Charlie can I just ask you as we finish to um share with us what's the number one thing that you'd like everybody to take away uh, from the session today uh, well the number one thing is that there is a uh, things are moving on really quickly and um whether it be high-grade serous ovarian cancer or clear cell or low-grade now I mean these these um these areas they're you know you know low grade I think ten or fifteen years ago you might say there was one group in the world working on it now there's a global consortium and um you know and you know with a number of trials actually either open or in the pipeline and that includes in the UK we've got um, two low grade studies running here in Edinburgh so there is you know I think on the horizon, I'm hoping there will be plenty of trial options and that some of those will prove to be effective. Lovely, thank you so much, Charlie. So we're just gonna close um, the Q&A now. So thank you so much to Charlie and Emma. There's been tons of technical information, statistics, et cetera. If you have any questions or concerns or would just like to have a chat, our support line is available. You can call us on 020-7923-5475 or you can find the details of how to email us on our website. So I'm sure you'll join me in saying a massive thank you to our experts for sharing their expertise with us today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed it and we hope you found it informative and helpful. So on behalf of the Target Ovarian Cancer team, thank you again for your time today and we hope to see you again soon. Bye.